Hey, what's going on, fellas? What we're looking at here is the oxyhydrogen cell. I ran it a little bit hard today, and it ended up blowing a gasket. A little bit too much back pressure, and I got it a little bit too hot. So, this thing's been running for about two years. I use it almost every day. And I basically build the nozzles for my oil burners with this thing. This right here is a jar of them. I am washing the flux off of them. But basically, I braze these things together. And this torch makes a very high temperature, low cost flame. So, I definitely make a lot of money with this thing. It's still in the experimental phases, believe it or not. I've been jacking around with it for about 10 years, slowly adding changes to it here and there. So after two years of hard use, I want to take it apart and change the plates all together, I think. I want to see what kind of shape these plates are in. They're just a little bit undersized for the gaskets that I have. And now that I have a plasma table, I can cut out any design I want. I got plenty of metal to do this all the stainless steel that I need. So I think we are going to decommission these plates that are in here and uh, come up with something that aligns a little bit better. I'll show you what I mean by the alignment being slightly off. But other than that, this thing has made me a lot of money. I mean, I've probably made a hundred grand with this thing. It is a phenomenal torch. Definitely worth the investment of uh, overhauling it. So going to be taking this thing completely apart and seeing what kind of shape everything is in after two years of uh, really hard use. Mescal, if you're watching, brother, these plates are yours, man, if you want them. We need to get one of those priority shipping boxes where the weight doesn't matter. I've also got a stack of plates over here that I was wanting to give you. I remember you asking me about the Joe cell. I don't recommend you build the Joe cell, brother. Those things are junk, man. I've built them, and after building dry cells, I can tell you that the output is just unmatched by a factor of 10. And I've built every kind you can think of. I've got these here I was going to give you. These are magnesium dioxide doped electrolysis plates out of a pool chlorinator. This particular type of dry cell arrangement is actually older than any of us watching this video. This thing um, is actually called a filter press configuration because of a type of filter press that used to exist back in the days. It was made out of a bunch of plates. None of these plates are electrically connected as far as a mechanical connection is concerned, the electricity travels through the electrolyte, which in this case would be a very strong sodium hydroxide solution, strong enough to cause a extremely severe burns or blindness. Well, there it is, fellas. Not too bad. Granted, the fact that I use this thing almost every other day, sometimes every day, for two years. This is the anode, obviously. It's the dirtiest one. And this would have been the cathode. The cathode is the side that produces hydrogen. And as a result, most of the buildup just flakes off. It's actually a self-cleaning process. It is a little bit damaged there. That's probably from when the cell shuts down, actually. And this here is uh, the oxygen side. This is what I meant by misalignment. Drilling through stainless steel is very hard to do. And when you got to do this many holes, um, I've had to use plates from other cells, other builds, to get this many. So they didn't line up with each other perfectly all the time. So I think I'm just going to completely redo this whole stack now that I have the equipment to do it. All right, so before everything gets buried, I want to show you guys these $12 fans I picked up on Amazon. They're high-speed AC waffle fans. Not the greatest thing in the world, but uh, they're better than the average little waffle fan, I think. 
and plus you don't need any rectifiers or transformers to run them made some brackets for the uh, mounting but uh, other than that I'm about ready to bury all this stuff we won't be able to see it the old plasma table is coming in quite handy these days this right here is the new profile it before it was just a hole but I've widened this thing out substantially so uh, this thing ought to behave quite differently kind of interested to see how this thing's gonna react all right fellas so here's a quick rundown of what I got going on here this is definitely not a beauty contest this thing is a workhorse so getting it back together and up and running as quick as possible is my primary goal I use that to make these bad boys right here and they are very important and very hard to make. You need a brazing torch to do it. And uh, this is the new setup. You see I have changed the fin configuration a little bit. The gasket stops right about where these rails are. So that acts as cooling fins. And I have found or fans mounted on both sides. You can see the cooling fins a little bit better there. The gaskets were a little bit smashed up, so the spacing isn't the best, but you can see there where the gaskets are. So the actual cell area. And this is what the plates look like now. So we've got a completely different flow configuration available. I'm interested to see how this works. And to make up for the amount of metal that I lost cutting these new plates out, I added two additional plates, so my volts per plate gap is going to be a bit different. So I'm hoping I don't lose too much performance as a result, because this is not about efficiency when you're building a torch. That, that'd be like trying to make a dragster efficient. That, you want to make it as inefficient and as powerful as possible. Efficiency in a torch is a ridiculous notion. It, it makes no sense. It's the exact opposite. You need high power. So... This is basically a cell, a cell design that I came up with about 10 years ago. Um, it's one of the best solutions that I've found. The reason why it has a dual exhaust on the top is to make up for the gas production. If you just got a single hose coming out the top, I feel that's just a severe restriction. And I think the cell per size can crank out more amps without a pump because if you pump electrolyte through one of these cells, you get more performance out of it. Because of the bubbles on the plates, they actually reduce the active surface area on duty. But if you got a large flow going through the pump or through the cell, you knock those bubbles free and you're allowed to liberate more gas and pull more current in the process. So that is why I have a Quadra manifold there. It actually has uh, four discharge ports. That's what these tops are. I'll back out a little bit so you can see what we got going on. I hate when people are trying to show you something online and they're all zoomed in and you can't see it. This little section right here is where the uh, coolant is sprayed back into the system from the radiator. Now this doesn't have a radiator fan on it. I typically just use like a squirrel cage fan like that laying over there set near the device because it often doesn't need a cooling fan if I'm running it on low. It only needs it when I'm running it on high. All right, fellas, I'm just mixing up some electrolyte here. In my case, I'm going to be using some high grade potassium hydroxide. This is the food grade. That's one of the cleanest you can get. And the reason I use the potassium versus sodium is because it can actually conduct more electricity with less electrolyte. Okay, I'm pulling about 1.6 amps here. I like to put in a real light solution in the beginning in case there's a big leak. That way I don't have a big sodium hydroxide mess. So it's just barely producing any gas at all. Yeah, that's quite a bit. can't really see the flame 
I'm gonna take you off the pedestal a second here. You can see what's going on inside of this thing. We're flowing away. Now this other one here is just barely running. But as I said, when we really gear up, when we're running at an extreme output, all four of them barrels go into action. But this is the current flow output. And uh, this is the flame I'm getting. Very useful flame right here. But, uh, I usually use acetone mixed with this gas. It's run through an acetone infuser. And I will show you that eventually. There's some gallium on the floor there. See if it strips this paint off the floor in some kind of new wave fashion. It's definitely spalling like crazy. Not a good idea. But uh, yeah, this flame's got a lot of uses. You can polish plexiglass with it. This is a dust shield. And this flame doesn't carburize the plexiglass. You can burn it, but it won't turn black. Okay, this is about 12 amps. That's 1400 watts. And uh, I just realized I've got an electric heater running I'm gonna have to turn off because that alters the voltage in here. Okay, so this is the acetone infuser. What I do is I connect the input from the torch on the top here and it goes down and bubbles through a chamber of acetone. That is currently about this deep. And what that does is make the flame extremely compatible for brazing. Because you all know what acetone does around hot copper. It causes a reaction that liberates a lot of heat, enough so that it can turn the copper red hot. So unlike other flames, the interface is actually heated by a catalytic reaction that turns acetone into formaldehyde. Pretty awesome. At least I think that's the reaction. Uh, nonetheless, straight oxyhydrogen is so hot that it will burn the flux into a crisp before you have time to solder anything. So if you hit an area you want to solder with the torch, it will burn the flux and render it useless. So you gotta heat the area around it. But as I said, oxyhydrogen is so hot, it can very quickly damage parts. So it's not suitable for brazing unless you're very delicate. It's just much better to run it through acetone. So let's take a look at that. Yeah, I don't know if I'm getting better efficiency or what. But at just 13 amps, to be able to do that is incredible. This is with the acetone, so it's not going to behave quite the same. A lot of oil in this pipe. But this can get you up to brazing temperature real quick. It's actually melting the metal there. So as you can see, it is hot enough to melt iron. Very unique flame. <clears throat> At about 91 degrees, so it's running pretty cool. You can see the gas flowing out the top there. Pretty awesome device. And this thing makes me a lot of money, so I can dig it. I'm going to turn that off before I blow myself up here. And of course, whenever you're doing precision work, this thing makes 
an amazing micro flame. Now I can make a flame about as small as the eye can see with this particular gas. This is straight oxyhydrogen gas right here. Nothing added to it. I'm going to try to zoom in on this flame here. See if we can get a focused look at it. You can go way smaller than this even if you needed to. Now one of the other cool things about this type of flame is it can completely disintegrate organic material. I've got a couple videos where um, it shows me burn a piece of hot dog into nothing. It will burn pieces of wood into nothing. You can literally drill a hole with oxyhydrogen gas in wood. If I'm not careful, it'll flash back, but yeah, you can't really see the depth of that. I also have a video showing where I burn a hole straight through a 2x4. Now, I don't know if you can see that, but that's a deep hole. This camera sucks. Oh, I hate you, iPhone. That's a hole, guys. Like, it's fairly deep. I'm trying to get you guys a look at it. So you can see just how deep it is. It's right on the verge of blowing out. Now, it doesn't look like it. This thing's actually about eight inches long. You can see a huge invisible part of it. Look at that. It is very invisible. Try to get you guys a side shot of this happening. So you can see the tremendous reach. So without that special tip that I showed you guys, um, you end up with these huge, massive needle flames. I'm trying to get a shot where you can see it. Watch what this sucker will do. That'll be like a three foot deep hole. And I should not have looked at that. That's one of the problems. It makes some blinding light. Yeah, we're just getting too much wash out to actually see this. But it just vaporized that. There is a deep hole there now. Even though that flame looks like it's only about two inches long, it's actually sticking out there, man, like a laser beam. Incredible. There it is. I'm not gonna show you the super micro flame because we've all seen the tiny oxyhydrogen flames online. It can do that too, obviously. <laughs> but anyway, thanks for the views, fellas, and all the support from you guys. And man, good luck out there. Be safe.